All right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, glad to see so many people joining for the 19th uh, Tequila Meetup. The second time we're doing it uh, remotely on Zoom. Uh, and we have, uh, we're very excited to have uh, a great speaker and a very interesting topic today. Um, so uh, welcome Anand uh, Bagmar, and he's gonna talk about test automation of real-time multi-user games. Thank you very much for, for joining us today and yeah, stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Martin and the Tequila Meetup group. Uh, it's been a pleasure following uh, all the meetups, what have been going on and the community building activities that uh, everyone is putting so much hard work in. Uh, it's very appreciated. And so from vodka to tequila, it's all good. It's uh, the spirit is growing uh, better and better every day. So very happy to see that. Uh, let's talk uh, today about test automation of real time and multi-user games. Before that, a very quick introduction about myself. I'm Anand Bagmar. I've been in the quality space for about uh, 20 years now. I've played various different roles uh, in teams, helping build a better quality product, uh, right from QA, manual tester, performance engineer, SDET, automation engineer, BA, project manager. I don't know what are the different roles, customer uh, success. Uh, that was very interesting, solution architect. So I play various different roles. It, the titles do not matter to me as long as I'm able to provide uh, some input and help make the product quality better for the end users. So that's what I do. Since the past two plus years, I've been doing consulting and freelancing uh, with various different organizations. I you know, figured that way I would get to learn more uh, by working on different complex uh, uh, issues and helping solve them for uh, my customers, my clients. This talk is based on one of the work that I did over there. Uh, I worked with a, a game company well, in India and very popular uh, game company. They build a lot of different games. Uh, the most popular games are uh, related with cards. And the topic today is based on how did, what was the problem statement over here? What were the challenges in testing and automating games like this? And what type of solutions I came up along with the team to implement those to solve that problem. So let's get started and understand what this game is really about. <clears throat> In this particular context, it's a card game. And of course, card games have specific rules. Each game has its own rules. Card games also have their own rules. In this particular case, you could play with real money. It's not gambling, but you're playing with real money. Uh, if you win, you win a good amount, um, or you buy points and use points uh, uh, to play the games. There are trial or learning modules before you start spending your points or money. Uh, you can learn about the game over there. And uh, the learning modules, you play with the uh, game engine itself directly, but the real games are multiplayer games. They could be between two to six players playing the game together. And of course, because it is multiplayer, they are going to be real time as well. Okay, so that is some information about the game. Let's understand the ecosystem, uh, how this game is going to be made available to the users. This game was available as Android uh, native app, iOS native app. It was also available as mobile web and web uh, on web interfaces as well. Interesting thing is the Android version 4.4 and above was supported, which means uh, the game was made available to the masses, even those who had really old handsets, uh, Android phones uh, with uh, uh, version 4.4 or above, they could play this game. <clears throat> As a result, there were millions of users that uh, this particular game uh, was played. Uh, and most of them were on Android native platform. Uh, so that meant that for a variety of these devices across the operating systems, old and new devices, the game should work well. It should have a consistent user experience. This was of course for the Indian market, 
uh, and uh, for that uh, matter, a few states from India were excluded because their uh, laws and policies did not allow these types of games uh, to be played in the state. The product team was amazing because uh, this is, of course, a mature gaming company, but uh, it got mature not just by building a good robust games. They also did, uh, did a lot of experimentation in the games. And we've heard about A-B testing. This was, they had almost about four to six types of different experiments going on in parallel in that game. And it was built in such a way that uh, you could configure and make those changes happen at runtime without anyone having to change anything on the app side. So again, a pretty good way of um, learning and doing more with the product, keeping your users engaged. I'm not gonna go through the whole architecture of the game itself, but uh, here are some core modules that uh, you need to be aware of. Of course, it's a game, so there is a game engine, which is the crux, the crucial part, uh, the heart and soul of the app itself, the game itself. Configuration is very important. I spoke about the experiments that can happen only because of configuration module. And it was tuned in such a great level of detail. You could configure and have different experiences, specific configuration sent out to specific users or specific types of devices or based on the operating system versions, based on which experiment needs to go out or not. Uh, how do you want these offers to go out to these users, devices, operating systems, what type of notifications? Everything was handled by the configuration module. There's a connection handler, which is again, a very important piece in the architecture uh, because this is a real-time multi-user game. Uh, so these connections are not based on HTTP, me <clears throat> HTTP messages, uh, but instead they are at socket level because it will guarantee much more better reliability and reconnection mechanisms. And at the same time, because users could be in any part of the country, they could be on poor networks or they could be moving from one place to the other. Uh, they're playing the game when they're traveling. So that means that they could uh, have connection droppage and then there has to be a retry mechanism or eventually the user would fall off the game. And again, the game engine has to calculate if the user falls off abruptly from the game before it completes, what does he or she win or lose based on that as well. There are a lot of microservices in uh, this, uh, which means again, there's a much more complex architecture behind the presentation layer, which makes it very interesting to test. <clears throat> and of course, databases and uh, Kafka and uh, whatnot you might really have over here to make sure that the game is going to work in a reliable, consistent fashion for millions of users uh, who are playing uh, the game on every single day. So 90 uh, millions of users, but a huge percentage of those users are very active users as well, okay? Now, because the game engine is a crux and you play with uh, real money, you can play with real money as well, the game engine has to be compliant from various different legal policies perspective, which means from a testability point of view, you cannot really instrument the game engine. Uh, that means I cannot set what set of cards a particular user should get in order to determine if that user should win or lose the game. So though I want to simulate the game uh, in its entirety uh, from start to finish, I cannot really predict if my user is going to win or lose the game. So that puts a lot of challenges in testing this game uh, or these types of games because of the compliance issues that the game engine being a black box, you're not being able to control that. So here are some of the challenges when it comes to testing games. Uh, compared to testing regular products, uh, the native apps or web-based, uh, here are some of the challenges. Games are much more unpredictable in nature compared to other products. It's, you, know, you understand and know uh, what are the different user flows that a user might go through for e-commerce site in terms of purchasing a product, for example. But for a game, it's a very different thing. So the how predictive or uh, predictable is your simulation going to be or actually users going to use uh, uh, playing the game are going to use it. It is very, very dynamic compared to regular products. The card game can, can potentially have very simple rules, but they are still much more complex compared to regular products in terms of the rule engine in most uh, cases. And uh, that is again a big challenge when it comes to testing it and automating it, especially when you don't know what the other users are gonna be doing over there. 
the interaction is also very complex. Uh, and this I'm talking more from a perspective of automation. Think of it like a uh, building a flight simulator, right? You don't want to be learning to fly a plane on a real plane. There are a lot of different uh, implications of that. So you have to build a flight simulator, which is not going to be as expensive. And of course, it's not going to do physical harm in case if you do not fly it correctly. Sorry about that, folks who are on the call already. Uh, so uh, we are talking about the interaction being complex, right? A regular e-commerce site or a native app uh, for any uh, product that you might have, website or a native app for that matter, the interactions are straightforward. You know, I click on something, I tap on something, what next should happen? But with a game, it is a very dynamic. Uh, it's very different around that because you are not uh, just clicking or tapping. You need to understand how that user interface is. Uh, you're playing, if I'm playing a card game, I need to select a particular card, I need to move it across. And that becomes very uh, challenging. So let's understand that a little bit more, what that means. So in games, to cater to these type of different devices and the user base that you have, in most cases, uh, there are complex graphics for that matter that are uh, rendered in the game. You have you would end up using a UI uh, rendering layer to help in the auto scaling and providing consistent and good user experience to your uh, users. Uh, these layers unfortunately have got very poor testability. And what do we mean by that? Testing tools cannot interact with them very easily. So what it means is whatever automation approach you end up taking because of such cases, you end up building a very complex automation framework and implementation, which is almost like an imitation of your end product. And that's why a flight simulator, though it's you cannot compare that to a regular plane, a real plane, but the kind of controls and simulations it can do, it's extremely complex in order to really train the pilots to fly the plane directly up when they get out of the simulator, right? So your test automation for games also, in many cases, might end up becoming so complex in their rules and the implementations, it's almost like a parallel implementation of what has happened in your actual product. Now let's talk more about that user experience in games, right? How do you really build a consistent user experience and uh, make that uh, work uh, better? <clears throat> there are two very popular game development frameworks. Uh, one is called Coco Studio uh, and the other is Unity. You can, uh, most of the gaming companies uh, will end up using uh, either of these uh, platforms to develop the presentation layer of the game. And they work across all different channels, uh, web, Android, uh, iOS as well. So you build it once and pretty much with very less effort, you can make it available across all the other platforms as well. And that's a very important aspect uh, in building games, uh, uh, the consistency and user experience aspect of it, okay? So what are the challenges uh, that I faced when uh, testing this particular game? There were non-existent uh, unit testing because again, it's a legacy code base. Uh, the company's been around for a long time. Games are around for a long time. Uh, but at the same time, there was not as much emphasis on unit testing in, e in the initial days. So non-existent unit testing. Functional testing was available only for the web. Why only for the web? Because it's first of all, easy to interact with the website. And second, uh, but unfortunately in this case, it was less than 5% of your users. So it did not really add much value. The bigger challenge was that it did not cover any core game automation because we could not figure out at that point in time, this was before my time at the company, uh, they could not figure out how to cover the core game automation scenarios. How could they interact with Coco's or uh, Unity? Now, for those who have not worked on uh, game testing before or have not worked with Cocos or Unity before, why is it so complex? Because uh, it's like the shockwave or flash uh, technology that we had in the uh, yesteryears where uh, it is deprecated. Now it's not used anymore, but you could not interact with those technologies as well. It's like an image 
uh, that uh, is presented, which keeps changing dynamically based on interaction. So these are the challenges uh, that were there. The even more so, there was no functional automation coverage for Android, which is more than 90% of the user base. And that is again a huge problem, right? How do you get confidence when you're trying to do uh, quick releases when uh, automation is not uh, available or helpful for you? And of course, the CI setup was very basic because what's the value of setting up a CI if you don't have tests to run as well? So these are the challenges. The bigger challenges came out when it, uh, for automation came out that the core game engine was very difficult to automate uh, because of Cocos and uh, Unity. You could not interact with that UI uh, layer using uh, most of the automation tools. And as a result, you cannot simulate uh, the real game scenarios. So what would uh, happen before automation was set up in place? If I have to simulate a six person uh, game, there used to be six people of the team, QAs, devs, uh, whoever involved, sit together and uh, through verbal interactions, of course, there was a strategy in place how they would uh, test it. But then through verbal interaction, six of them joined the game at the same time. And then accordingly, they would simulate uh, the game uh, manually. But how much can you do in such fashion and how often will you be able to do that, right? So that's where the question really came across. How do you automate games? And this is a strategy that we follow. We all know about the test automation pyramid, uh, about the value it brings. Unit testing should be maximum, uh, followed by web service tests. And then at the end, uh, the UI or end-to-end -end tests. However, in this particular case, as I mentioned earlier, the unit testing uh, was non-existent. So this is the approach that we took uh, for uh, building automation over here. So the first thing that was required to be done is, of course, set up your strategy make everyone understand what is the value of test automation. The value, uh, these are the principles that we set up. The test should run on every code change, whether it's on product side or test side. It should be running locally as well as in CI, and that's how developers eventually, or QA should be able to run the tests on their machine. And then when they push the changes, it would run in CI as well. The test execution results uh, should be looked at with utmost priority uh, because it's no use if you just run the test on every change. If you do not look at the results, it's a wasted cause. So look at the results, do root cause analysis on the failures and act on the results uh, to make your product quality better. With these principles in place, this is how we set up the uh, architecture for the automation framework. This was a high level architecture of what needs to happen. You specify your test as intents, what uh, your test is expected to do in terms of business functionality. This I'm talking from a functional automation perspective, end-to-end -end test. The test will uh, talk only business terminology, the business actions that could be done. And that itself is an orchestration between other business actions or actual interactions with the app or product under test. And uh, you can look uh, at this in more detail later. Uh, so, sorry, Anand, uh, I think you are... I hope you're Yeah, see we it. can see it now, thank you. Okay, great. I'm just going to go back to what I was speaking about value of test automation. So these are the uh, principles that we set about how uh, test automation should be done. Uh, what are the principles we want to, what is a North Star, basically, that we want to set up from an uh, automation perspective. Once these principles were agreed upon, we set up the automation framework, uh, architecture, high level architecture. What, how are we going to approach uh, this particular uh, automation? And this was very important because you don't want to have uh, code written in very haphazard way, which will not be usable, scalable, maintainable going forward. And this was by experience uh, that I saw in the organization and my other experiences as well. It's very important to set up a blueprint of how we want to approach automation in order to be able to doing this. So once this uh, automation framework guideline was set up, identified the tech stack to be used for automation in such cases. Uh, for these types of products. And the tech stack that we ended up using was APM was an obvious choice because we wanted to test against uh, Android, iOS, mobile web. And for web, we would use a different driver, of course. But APM was an obvious choice. Java was the obvious choice from a programming language perspective uh, because it gave more structure, though it might not be as efficient as uh, some other languages. But it would provide a good structure uh, 
you know, to the engineer as that would be automating this. We ended up using APM test distribution and open source framework uh, developed um, and available, uh, which made it easy to manage the devices and the infrastructure, uh, manage APM and the devices uh, so that we didn't have to worry about it. You just plug in a device and run the test. It will take care of it automatically. And uh, this was again, very, very helpful. From a reporting perspective, because that's a very important aspect from automation, you need to be able to see the results of your test. Report portal was used, which was very lightweight, very easy to set up, very lightweight to use, and it gave uh, good widgets um, from a visualization perspective. And of course, uh, the CI server was uh, Jenkins. We set it up in terms of uh, raising, uh, running the test automatically when PRs are raised or uh, merges happen, as well as uh, auto trigger it based on any upstream uh, new builds that are being uh, built, the test would run automatically. Once this blueprint was set up and the basic infrastructure was set up in place, uh, came uh, the time to actually write the tests. He set up guidelines about how the test itself should be written. The test should be specified just once. What do we mean by that? The same game can be played on Android or iOS or web or mobile web. I don't want to create four different tests just in terms of running it on these different channels. I want to specify the test once and based on the parameter which uh, channel I want to execute it on, automatically the implementation will take care of. The test should have clear business objectives. It should not be about click and do specific actions. No, it should be about business actions. Should I be logging in? I should be able to join a game. What are the business actions that I want to achieve? That is what the test is going to specify. It will not have any clutter of implementation details or assertions. Assertions are impl implicitly called by the implementation of your business objectives. If I say I want to join a game, there should be assertion in that business objective implementation to say, have I joined that game correctly or not? So automatically assertion would be thrown from it. And very important again was we want to tag the key of uh, what we mean by uh, this test intent. The tags or annotations are there. This uh, was again uh, using test ng as a runner. So we just used the uh, groups as an annotation to say what type of tags I want, whether it's features, components, modules, or certain specific execution cycles. Over here, we have some utility methods, but the real crux over here is I'm talking about business operations, new login BL, which is a login business operation. I log in using some username password. And then based on that, because I'm using method chaining extensively, and as a rule, we are going to be using method chaining. Automatically, I know which are the next logical set of business operations I can execute. And at the end, I say, and my test is done over here. Okay. So this is how I specify my test. And just anyone in the team looking at this test knows exactly what this test uh, named repeat, dep uh, repeat deposit add cash test. What is it really doing? What are the business operations required? to complete this test. Now, once this was done, there was of course a challenge in doing this type of test intent specification. As QAs, unfortunately we are used to, as automation engineers, we are unfortunately used to writing automation in form of what are the clicks and actions I want to do in terms of automating that test. We don't think about the business operations or the business objectives I want to achieve from this particular test execution. And that is, uh, uh, learning curve that the team members needed to go through. Also, of course, what this means is I'm not just going to copy paste a test and make some few modifications to it. Even if I need to copy paste, I'm copy pasting business objectives. I'm not copy pasting actions. And then because refactoring uh, can be done very easily in this fashion, not at the test level. So you know, it becomes very easy to prevent uh, code smells uh, coming into the picture in that case. Itself. So the advantages of this approach is the test talk, the business terminology, the different platform implementations are hidden at the uh, uh, internal you know, to the implementation itself. We can automatically reuse uh, uh, data uh, that is there uh, from the test and the test generation and all becomes uh, seamless across. Tests become independent. 
I don't care about which test is going to run in which sequence because each test is really complete in its own way. So now I can run my tests in parallel in any sequence. It would not matter. And this approach worked great for the functional aspects of the test, but we still haven't gone to the game engine, the crux of the product, right? This was good for all the aspects where the game engine was not involved. So now let's talk about the game engine, which is really the meat of the product. The core feature of the product is the real-time multiplayer game. And you can see from the uh, screenshot in the background, the main user who is uh, the user who has opened the game on his device is the one on the bottom over here uh, of the screen. But on the top of the screen where you see all these different uh, empty seats or certain usernames and amounts over here, these are the other users who are part of the game. Empty seats mean though this is a six player game, I only have four players running uh, connected right now, but two of them dropped. They dropped either because of connection issues or they dropped the game because they uh, didn't have good hands and they just want to exit the game itself, right? So this is a type of uh, complexity that comes up and the cards can be dealt with. Uh, you get a set of uh, cards in hand, automatically the game engine gives that to you, but then you can pick cards and drop cards. There's whatever the uh, game really means over there, right? So for this type of a game, the simulation is a challenge because the UI is rendered using Coco Studio and APM cannot interact with Coco Studio or Unity for that matter. Okay. So the first challenge is about how can we handle the interaction with Coco Studio and how did we overcome that? And this is where I came across a, a technology or a framework called Pocos, which is, uh, which helps you to automate the UI automation frameworks uh, such as Unity, Cocos, and other native Android apps uh, technology that might be there. So if you're using Cocos or Unity, Poco is the way to go from an automation perspective to help with that. So what we did over here is Poco Story with the Airtest ID, which is again open source uh, IDE available, which supports Android, iOS, uh, Windows, web, uh, and uh, especially games. Cocos is integrated with um, air test ID and it's like an inspector that you can have uh, to inspect your game and it can give you information from the UI rendering layer that has been presented to you. Okay. So how did we use Pocos for automation? It's not uh, very straightforward. Unfortunately, you have to uh, do uh, some amount of work in order for you to be able to use this. So uh, it's a multi-step process. The first step is of course is to integrate and what do we mean by integrate? This is a POCOS SDK that you have to integrate into your app itself. And this is like a library. You might use a logging library or any other libraries, right? So you would integrate this SDK in your library. And of course, because you're integrating something into your product, you want to do it selectively only for debug builds, for example, or your QA environments so that it does not uh, extend uh, the app size or performance issues would not come up because there's more that the uh, web page is doing over there. And of course, you don't want to expose testability hooks into production as well, okay? So you would integrate it only in debug builds. Once this SDK is available into your product, then the developers need to extend the product functionality to use this SDK, right? Just using a library is not enough unless you call APIs on that library. And uh, for that matter, what needs to happen is the developers would need to, for every screen, that is there in the game uh, or in the application, they need to create methods. So POCOS communication happens at socket layer. So they would create methods uh, and implementation in the product to say, for example, if I'm picking a card, I need to send a message uh, to the socket saying that, okay, this card is picked up, for example. This was just an example. Of course, these methods would depend on the context of the game itself. So developers would write uh, methods to say, for these different types of methods, what is the information that I need to send back over there? In our context, what was really important is why this is important focus. I cannot interact with it, but what I want to use focus for is I know which elements from my game are important to me. And if I'm able to get the coordinates of those elements, then I can use the simple tap functionality from APM. I provide the coordinates of that element uh, to APM and it will do a tap action on the device itself. So what I want to use this is the POCOS functionality should give me for the screen that is rendered uh, on the device right now. I want to know the coordinates of the elements on that particular uh, screen. So this particular implementation that developers will do 
they know what type of um, implementation is uh, there, uh, what screen is being rendered, what elements are existing on that screen, and they need to figure out based on the device coordinates, which they have a handle on from an internal uh, implementation perspective. Fetch the device coordinates, fetch the device resolution, based on that do a mapping and provide a coordinates in middle of that particular element uh, to the socket layer. Okay, there could be other types of messages as well that are required to be provided. Uh, for example, I want to know uh, if my I can sort the cards in my hand, and I want to get a list of those cards. That is not just the elements that I want uh, the coordinates for the uh, cards that are there, right? I want to get the list of cards that I want to that are displayed for that user. So you can implement these specific methods based on your business functionality or game functionality in the Poco's layer inside the app. And now you have a library that has been extended to use in your game engine, which can provide these details to you. Once you have this, now you start consuming these different APIs. Now I mentioned that these uh, communication, the, this data is going to come across a socket layer to you, right? So you would start a socket layer a uh, socket server and the app, the game engine will send messages. It will do whatever it's supposed to do anyway. But in addition, if it's a debug build, it will also send messages to the socket server based on requests that come to it. Okay. This socket server can either be started inside the app or as an external process. So what we mean by that is, Inside a device where the game is running, you can have a socket server started inside that app itself. And there could already be a lot of different socket connections established inside your app anyway, right? You're starting an additional socket server over here. But in this case, this socket server is going to be used by your test automation framework to communicate with the game directly. So now this gets interesting. You're, there are two types of interaction your test is going to have with the game. One, using APM where I'm doing uh, end user actions or simulations of end user actions, whether tap, swipe, or whatever else is there, uh, click, uh, that might be there. But another set of actions is, I'm going to send socket messages to the app directly and ask it to do certain things, either get information or do certain, uh, get different type of information that is their coordinates or anything else that might be there. So the first approach is socket server inside the app. Second approach, is socket server is outside the app as an external socket server and the test framework connects to that socket server as well as the app connects to that socket server as well. So the app also becomes like a client to that server and messages are going to go to and fro over here. So what this means is there are now two approaches to send and receive messages. Uh, and you need to build some utility to handle this as well. Now, once this part of integration is done and extension is done, you need to send uh, these messages. You need to know, okay, what is the locator that I'm uh, of the, the ID of the element for which I want to send messages or get coordinates for, right? So this is similar to my uh, DOM that I have in the web where I have an ID or a class name and I want to get information about that or do actions on that particular element. In Cocos, because I didn't even know which elements are there, I can just retrieve that complete DOM information either using air test ID because of this integration. Now air test ID will also tell me all the DOM information that exists. And with the DOM information, I can now query that from a test automation as well, using that as a reference. So I know my uh, start game button has got an ID of uh, start game that I was able to figure out using air test ID. Now using that ID, I will use that in my test implementation and I will be able to query it now using the socket, get me locators uh, for that element, and I'll be able to tap on it if required, or I'll be able to get uh, different types of messages. Now, you have to make this easy for the implementers as well, right? And in this case, what would happen is, I to make it seamless about which type of message am I really passing? Am I using APM or am I using socket communication? I chose to call this a POCO driver object that I've created to do the socket communication in my test implementation. I also created specific DSLs. I don't want to deal with socket messages directly from my test. I'll create meaningful DSLs 
which are applicable to my game and that will be able to uh, get better information flowing across uh, to the users or rather from the implementation so now the driver if i say driver dot find element that is going to be for apm web driver communication for non cocos implementation poco driver is going to be for cocos implementation or unity interaction that i want so if i say poco driver dot find element by id add cache button this locator i got from my air test id when i did the inspection i put that in my code and what this is going to do is it's actually going to talk on the socket layer query the uh, pocos pocos will query that no uh, pocos dom and give me the coordinates back and i'm just doing a click on it click i chose to call it because it keeps its similar uh, implementation to the apm or selenium driver right so i just need to know if i'm doing a poco driver interaction or a apm or a selenium web driver interaction and the rest everything is uh, works seamlessly the next challenge uh, that comes to game simulation so first part we solved is about how to interact with the game engine itself but that doesn't solve the part or uh, the complexity of the simulation itself the simulation is a big challenge because now i could have millions of users or hundreds or thousands of users who are playing the game at the same time but my game table can have maximum 6 players so the minute uh, the seventh player comes in a new table will be created automatically and the user sits on that table okay so it's a auto scaling model of sorts uh, more number of people come more tables are created and they'll sit randomly with uh, whoever i cannot control which table i want to play uh, on or which user i want to play on but that is a big problem from a test automation simulation perspective i need to ensure whichever number of users i want to have in the simulation that they are sitting on the same game table only then i can do the interaction with them of uh, and uh, simulate the game also what i want to do is i need to be able to ensure any of these users i'll be able to self drop them or uh, simulate connection broken or for that matter do specific actions on the game itself okay so these are my uh, challenges and also requirements from that perspective so there are two ways how you, i can do this now because i have my poco driver implementation i could take that approach and i can have six devices connected to the computer and for these six devices the test during execution can say i want to use only four of these devices or i want to use all six of them right depending on how many users i want to simulate and uh, so that is one option the advantage of this is that this is a very realistic simulation of what is really going to happen in the real world the end users there will be different users on different types of devices who are playing the game and they are coming together to play the game against each other but the challenges are severe in this case one the number of devices keep increasing uh, as more number of simulations need to be do uh, you need to execute if you just have six devices that means all your test simulations are going to queue one after the other and that's a big limitation again so more infrastructure is required cost and maintenance activity increases over here the test implementation and orchestration also becomes more challenge because now my test not only needs to interact with one device one app in one device it needs to interact with potentially six apps in six different devices and it's going to make my test very very heavyweight and very brittle also the test execution uh, cycle uh, increases as a result because now you have to run these in sequence or there's a limit on how many devices you can really get and uh, the biggest challenge though is how do i ensure all six of these users who are connected on real devices are going to connect to the same game it is quite possible in my orchestration i connect to one game by the time i get my second user to join the same game someone else from my organization or from a real world connects to the same game and sits on the table which means my uh, sec the next user might not get seat on that table itself and that's a big problem in my simulation so this approach was very quickly discarded it's not even an option in that sense here's the other option which actually makes sense what if i can have a app running a game running on one device and my other users who need to be on the table playing with me are all virtual users and if i am able to simulate this that can become a huge advantage because now 
I can ensure, hopefully, that all of my virtual users are on the same table as the real user. The disadvantage, of course, is how do I ensure that? I need to build utilities uh, for this kind of control and simulation, which means I am going to need a lot of dev help to make that happen. But this is the approach that made most sense, and this is the approach that we took going forward. So, how did we create these users? We set up our requirements. I should be able to create users on demand, and this will help keep the tests independent and allow them to run in parallel. The users should be created with specific criteria. How much um, cash balance should they have, for example? What is the criteria that they should have in able uh, to be playing the games and diff of different nature? I need to uh, be able to control which game table the user needs to join. Only then can I get all the users on the same table uh, to uh, simulate the game. And of course, I need to be able to know which user's turn it is in order to be able to do actions on that particular user. And these set of actions have to be as real as the real user, as if I'm connected to the game now in my uh, on my device, right? It has to be as real as that. And that's where we started thinking about these virtual users as bots. Bots will have certain defined functionality, what they should be able to do, and uh, I'll be able to control that. So that's what we did. We implemented bots uh, in this uh, framework. These bots are actually implemented using uh, API tests because API tests, fortunately, in this particular case, they had a good number of API tests that were available. So we extracted the API test implementations into a reusable library, which we called as a bot library. We had to, of course, add added functionality in this uh, library to support the usage as bots, which was required from a functional test implementation perspective. And the advantage of this approach was that if the APIs get updated, the API test team would automatically extend uh, or uh, evolve this API test implementation. As a result, automatically the bot library will get updated. So we didn't have to worry about keeping the bots in sync with the API implementation as the product evolves or the API evolves. And hence, this was a lightweight approach uh, where it was a bot library integration versus a multiple uh, device uh, integration and it's overhead over there. The other thing which was important uh, is what we created as a common DSL to interact with the bots. Again, it has to be in the way we spoke about Cocoa driver versus driver. The test implementation needs to be uh, clear about am I interacting with the real device or am I interacting with the bots? And uh, how do I handle the situations or simulations based on that? And that again uh, made life very easy. One thing that I want to add over here, not all bots are based on AI. In this case, we chose, uh, we called it bots, but these were really based on API calls that we used to be done internally. There is no AI involved over here at all. So how did our test intent uh, get uh, evolved because of this? We remember our earlier implementation of our test intent. That got evolved because now what we are also doing is we are doing bot simulation uh, along with this. So the first part of this is common. It's just regular uh, APM interaction. Login, click on play game, click on specific type of game. But after that point is where the Coco's layer comes across. And over there, uh, we say, with number of players, what is the point value? I want to start playing now. And internally, it will call the Poco driver, get the coordinates, and it will click on those or rather tap on those coordinates to do that. Now, when I say start playing now, over here, I'm saying join bot players to game and pass it a player list. In player list, in this case, I'm saying I want to have only one bot join uh, this game. And that's what I've created as APIs. Setup users is creating those uh, virtual users. And that virtual users, I'm going to join to the game with this kind of DSL, join bot players to game. The test implementer does not need to worry about how each bot is going to join. It just passes that list to the bots, and that takes care of it. And similarly, we keep on doing the simulation. Play first round means the user with the real device is going to do that simulation. Bot pick close card and discard card. This I'm telling all the bots in the game, in the correct sequence, pick a card and discard a card automatically. Okay. This is not about one bot or uh, even if there are five bots, all those bots would do this action automatically. And so on, this simulation uh, continues. Here's a closer look at this. Join bot players to game 
and play first round that means i'm telling all the bots play the first round and get the game in a proper uh, in a ready state in a common state this is important because when you play card games there is one uh, person who will be starting playing the game and that uh, depends on who wins the toss for example right the real player could win the toss or one of the bot players could have won the toss so i need to get the game to a consistent state for my simulation to start and that's how these dsls were created as well to uh, get everyone on the same page before the simulation starts so this is how we overcame the challenges of interaction with the game engine and doing the simulation of the virtual users as well and now i am able to automate all the different simulations in terms of on the actual execution we tried various different cloud solutions because again though i want the ability and i do want to run my test locally as well i do want to uh, run this at scale on every commit every change that happens and doing this locally is going to be a limitation for hardware time and all those the uh, maintenance aspects as well so we tried a lot of different cloud solutions but there were a lot of challenges because geo restrictions was a issue stability of those infrastructures uh, we found was a big issue as well and at scale this did not work for us so as a result we ended up implementing our uh, own uh, mad lab mobile automation device lab uh, you can read about this from my blog uh, i have written about mad lab in uh, how to set up your own lab in house so we used mad lab with apm test distribution over here from a execution infrastructure perspective to manage setting up this infrastructure i hate doing anything manually more than a couple of times uh, because it's just not scalable or repeatable so we set up shell script to set up the complete test execution environment for mac as well as linux uh, which did all the setup including apm android sdk and all other dependencies required run a script other than passwords or anything required to be entered as part of installations everything was automated so you don't need to do any setup on your own so you just connect your device run a gradle command with specific tags if you want to run subset of test and your test will execute automatically a ci infrastructure was also automated because this was a complex infrastructure and execution cycle uh, we configured a jenkins jobs uh, using a code uh, jenkins file which was checked into version control system bit bucket in our case uh, which means even if the jenkins server went down we just create a job pointed to the jenkins file and everything we are ready to go again this uh, we our ci setup was on linux machines uh, with hardware uh, uh, hardware meaning sufficient disk space for logs and um, good memory for supporting apm uh, execution as well and four to five android devices uh, connected to each of these for ios we had mac minis which had iphone connected as well as android devices and we could leverage this as well we set up build triggers uh, to set up on uh, pull requests and merges when it happened and also on upstream uh, builds when they were generated automatically these tests used to get triggered and of course there were alerts based on uh, test failures which means you could go and take a look at it uh, quickly and take the next set of action on it of course to take action you need good test reports i mentioned we use report portal a uh, very easy to set up uh, it's available as a docker container as well so you just run one command if you have docker on your machine run one command you have test report uh, uh, sorry report portal uh, running you can configure it very quickly and for each game that we automated we use the same report portal server with different buckets over there for each game uh, for each product uh, so it made it easy to segregate the results as well as uh, look at it all uh, in one place as well so advantages of course were easy setup uh, is there for report portal community is active it is fast and the custom widgets will allow you uh, will give you very interesting visualizations on uh, your test executions the other challenges uh, that uh, we uh, overcame uh, were in the journey continues right we kept on evolving over there things that we still cannot do over there is simulate the winning versus losing scenarios if i cannot control which hands the user is going to get i cannot do the overall simulation so this is not really a flight simulator you know, to learn flying a plane but we can still do a lot of uh, majority of the scenarios can be uh, automated in this fashion except for few things which are still not automatable uh we did not get to a stage of having different types of these implementations from a real simulation perspective one user on android another on ios another on web another on mobile web for example this was still a problem for us 
uh, we could not overcome that challenge. So these are still opportunities uh, for the future, how uh, things can get better in that. But hopefully these type of uh, uh, solutions shared with you as a case study gives you insight on how you can overcome challenges from a real user, uh, real time multi-user game simulation, how to interact with layers, which uh, you cannot automate easily and still build a good end-to-end -end CI uh, based, CI CD based solution from an automation perspective as well for such games. So some references over here for you to take a look at. And at this point, I will stop and look at the questions. Sorry, I could not look at questions earlier uh, because of uh, some issue that happened in Zoom, but we can look at that right now. Yeah, so I think we don't have any questions as of uh, now on the chat. But okay. I'll give everyone a chance to, to post their questions. In the meantime, oh yeah, thanks for a very interesting, insightful uh, presentation. It was a really great talk. Uh, and I have a question uh, maybe to, to kick off the Q&A. Sure. Um, so you've been talking a lot about the end-to-end -end aspect of the testing. Uh, whether, what was the, the overall testing strategy, like whether other aspects, for example, the gaming engine that uh, has been tested at a different level, maybe not end-to-end, -end, but unit test level. Can you talk a little bit about what Absolutely. makes sense if I'm testing a game, what do I test end-to-end -end versus what do I test with other means? Absolutely. So the part that I did not speak about uh, today in interest of time uh, and also the focus would have shifted to a different direction. You need to have a quality strategy for your product. I don't even call it a test strategy, right? Test strategy is typically associated with the QA team, what the QA team does. You need to have a quality strategy for your product. How am I going to make sure the requirements are correct? How is my development team going to get better, deeper insights into what other things can be tested from the QA team or from other roles so that they can build the product better? And of course, uh, write the right types of unit tests, integration tests before they say that this particular user story is uh, ready for testing for you, right? Uh, so there was a lot of things done over here in terms of building testability in, into the product. But if you talk purely from a case study perspective, it was a mature product when I joined the team to solve this particular problem. There was a lot of legacy code base uh, from the game engine, front end app perspective and everything, uh, which meant that writing unit tests is not very easy even after the fact, because the product is really complex and it's not built with testability in mind, right? But what we did is we set up criteria for definition of done on every story. So based on the requirement, what types of tests for each new user story is going to be before we say that this story is complete. So if we are building a new functionality, of course, there has to be 80, 90% at least of unit test coverage, for example. This has a web service impact. So we need to do API testing as well as uh, maybe there's performance and security implications as well. I need to test that also with this, right? So we, for every new functionality, we really focused on the test pyramid and seeing how can we try and do the best possible pyramid for this particular module for the new functionality that exists. There is, was a different plan for the existing legacy code base that existed. And that's how we evolved into this. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, still no, no question. Mm. Uh, another thing, the air test uh, test framework that you mentioned, like what are the kind of interactions that you can do with um, with the app? Is it comparable to Appium? Like you mentioned, clicking does it support any any other UI interaction as well? Or how sophisticated uh, is the framework? Oh, it is very sophisticated. It is uh, very good. So it's like APM, uh, no, for that matter, the APM inspector that you would uh, load up or the UI automator viewer or something. Uh, the difference is over here with APM, you can interact only with the native controls, right? You'll be able to see what is there, what the locators are or what data is there, what the DOM structure internally is there. With Airtest, because it can interact with Cocos and Unity as well, you'll be able to click on the Cocos layer and see that interaction also from uh, Airtest ID. And it has a preview window. You can click in the interactions over there, or you can click on the device and it will uh, show the uh, 
DOM for that particular set of elements as well. It works with uh, native apps as well as web uh, as well for that matter. So it's pretty uh, very powerful. We are used to using APM inspector or if it's a web-based product, we'll just open the developer tools, inspect element and get the locators, right? It becomes complex in terms of the gaming engines and that's where you would end up using air test because it's another tool that you would need to install for it. Uh, that said, another aspect that is important from an air test perspective, it will show you only what the developers have exposed as functionality for you, right? So that's why it's important when you integrate the SDK into your app, the devs have to say for these elements, here are the locators for it. So you can still, you still need to provide the locators and IDs for all those elements. The difference is whether it's a native layer or a Cocos layer element, uh, element identification that you're doing. So once the developers expose that as part of the uh, Cocos layer, in air test ID, you can see the uh, locators for native as well as for uh, Cocos layer or Unity layer. And you can use that information to implement your tests. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, yeah. Abhijit is asking, were these tests part of the game's build pipeline? How was the CI build pipeline like? Yes, these tests were part of the game's uh, build pipeline. And as the uh, test framework kept on getting evolved, we separated these into two different types of uh, tests. Though there was no real reason for doing it, but we still uh, did that. So of course, it starts with your unit test, whatever exists, uh, do the build. There'll also be a sonar check. The build will fail if uh, any of that has, uh, uh, those criteria have failed. After that, the web, uh, web uh, API tests will execute. And after that, the functional tests would run. Now remember, this is a very complex product, right? There are, there could be tens and uh, literally almost three digit uh, worth of uh, number of repositories that might exist because of microservices and everything over here. So you really have to think what your trigger points are in this particular case that is going to help you do the right thing. So in my context, the way we set it up is for the Android and iOS build, because that was a major user base. I focused mainly on the native app side in this case. Whenever these builds are uh, triggered, of course, unit tests will run and uh, the sonar checks will run over there. If that worked fine, then we'll trigger the functional tests. Functional tests, we'll run the game engine tests as a separate pipeline and these tests as a, uh, the non-game engine tests as a separate pipeline because you'll get feedback faster in that sense. Another big problem uh, that I forgot to mention earlier that came across over here is uh, these days, a lot of devices have got a notch for the camera on the front screen. And that messes up the calculation of the coordinates where you should really tap on the screen. And that depends if I want to extend the screen in the notch area or not. That's a user defined setting, right? Uh, user controlled setting. So the developers had to uh, figure out that aspect to figure uh, on the device when the app is rendered, as the test is running, the app is rendered at runtime, the app is figuring out what are the coordinates for this particular element that the user is requesting for, that the test client is uh, requesting for, and then provide that over there. So that was the CI pipeline that we set up over here. I uh, hope that okay. answers the question, Abhijit. Uh, the next question is from Sham. Uh, will the same strategy be suitable for large level, multiplayer or uh, real time player games like Clash of Clans? Uh, I don't know what that MMORPG is, but I'm guessing it's multiplayer real time uh, players uh, kind of games uh, like Clash of Clans. Yes, I don't see a uh, yeah, multiplayer online role player games. Yes, of course it will, uh, it will work. Uh, that said, the strategy will work. The implementation of course might need to be slightly different based on the context of that game itself. But the strategy, the approach definitely will work for that type of game as well. Uh, the next question, how would you approach testing a game in black box setup? For example, a finished product where you can't work with devs to add testability features. Well, your hands are tied in that case, right? Uh, if the developers are not able to give me locators from a focus layer perspective to do this uh, kind of uh, interaction, unfortunately, I could not think of any other strategy to automate this game. 
there has to be collaboration with the devs to give you those locators to integrate that sdk give you that locators give you the dsls required to query the type of information that you need to take meaningful actions from your simulation perspective so if that collaboration is not there uh, unfortunately there's very little that you can do to add value from automation perspective for this okay thank you i think that's that's all the questions and we're roughly at an hour so again thank you very much a really interesting uh, presentation uh, thanks to all the participants